I'm Michael Mello, President of the Board. Events are planned throughout the year, so it's just not tonight. We've got another event next Saturday. Tonight, our town historian, Jim Garman, will review our history with you. Jim is a former trustee. He was one of the people that got me involved <laughs> many years ago. I spent more time at the library than I have. More than half my life has been at the library. <laughs> I believe that. His, his late wife, Dottie, was a trustee for many years and is terribly missed by the board. Uh, before I introduce Jim Garman, I want to introduce Linda Udifusa, who's going to read the town proclamation. Um, thank you, um, Mr. Mello. So, the town of Portsmouth, Rhode Island has this proclamation in commemoration of the 125th anniversary of the Portsmouth Free Public Library. Whereas, Portsmouth Free Public Library and its librarians and staff have played a vital role in connecting people with the resources they need to live, learn, work, govern, and thrive for 125 years and Whereas Portsmouth residents use Portsmouth Free Public Library to find jobs, to learn to read, to be literate online, to find vital health facts, to research their environment and enrich the lives of people of all ages, and whereas librarians are the guardians of free access to information and resources, libraries are for everyone, everywhere, and whereas Portsmouth Free Public Library has something unique to offer that ties its community together, and whereas Portsmouth Free Public Library houses the Portsmouth History Center to collect our town's past for future researchers, and whereas Portsmouth Free Public Library is just as important a part of a community's infrastructure as any road, bridge, public building, or utility, and whereas Portsmouth Free Public Library is a place of opportunity, education, and self-help, all libraries play an important role in the American dream. And whereas Portsmouth Free Public Library provides everyone who uses the library access to the world, nowhere else can you have access to nearly anything on the web or in print, as well as personalized assistance in finding it. And whereas in times of the instability of the recent health crisis, Portsmouth residents could turn to and depend on their local library and staff for access to its resources, and whereas thousands of people pass through the library each year, and now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Kevin M. Aguiar, um, <laughs> town council president, who is unable to attend, proclaim Portsmouth Free Public Library an important part of the town of Portsmouth. I encourage all residents to support and use their library discover or rediscover the wealth of resources available at Portsmouth Free Public Library. Dated this 18th day of March, 2022, uh, Kevin M. Aguiar, Town Council President, uh, attested by our clerk, Jennifer West. So thank you so much, Mr. Garden. We have another one from the state le legislature, Michelle or Terry, they're going to read it, or they can read it together. It's much shorter, so <laughs> much shorter. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, first, uh, thanks, uh, thank you everybody for coming out to celebrate tonight. Yes. This is a really, really uh, momentous occasion. And really, it just says, in recognition of the momentous celebration of their 125th anniversary and exceptional service to the community, we recognize the Portsmouth uh, Free Public Library. And on their 125th anniversary. So, yes. congratulations. Yes. I have uh, quite a few slides, and um, so get comfortable. <laughs> it's pretty hard to summarize 125 years, but nonetheless, we're going to try that. So, the Portsmouth Library, from this, if I can get it right. That's where it started. It's a great picture of it. To this. Okay. I, I, I try not to read this, but I probably will read some of it because there's just try to keep it all together. 
The library was established in 1897 in the month of March. And here in, in 20, 2022, we're celebrating 125 years of service to the town of Portsmouth. In 1997, we had a, a, a celebration of 100 years, and I gave the lecture. So I couldn't find it, though, to do the same one over. <laughs> the library is a vibrant part of our town and has served it as much more than just a lending library, which is how these things started sometimes. Um, it would seem really worthwhile to look a little bit at what the town looked like in 1897. I just have a couple photographs to show you in a couple minutes. But a, a little bit of a description of what the town was like. It was a rural farm-based community. I came across recently a newspaper article from, I think it was from 1907, that said that Portsmouth has, has sit in, sat in the background while Newport went on to all these advances and everything. Thank God, glad they did. I'm glad we didn't. I'd I, I sometimes think about what would this town be like if it was like Manhattan, you know, the whole island, just all streets and roads and everything. Thank God that didn't happen. So the population was about 1,949, and they were scattered around uh, the same area that we have today. The East and West Main Roads were there. They've been there since 1640. And so they, they were the main routes along. And, and, and Newport was founded in 1639, by the way, the year after Portsmouth. So those roads were there from then. The streets were dirt, and in the summer they oiled them to keep down the dust. Transportation, for the most part, in 1897 was by horse or horse and buggy. There was no form of public transportation on the island, but plans were in the works. Uh, Newport had established a trolley line back in 1888, sort of internal within the city. It ended at, at uh, One Mile Corner. But now plans were being made to expand it uh, out the the two mile corner and then out to East Main Road. It eventually would run through the town to Park Avenue in Island Park, cross the, uh, cross the Stone Bridge and go on to Fall River when the Stone Bridge was in operation and it wasn't always in operation. And, but that was the only bridge off the island. The Newport and Fall River Street Railway would begin operations in 1898. So this was all going on right about that time. So a view of a busy day on the East Main Road around that time was that. <laughs> okay. This is uh, the East Main Road heading south at Sprague Street, and you can see the trolley in the background. I hope the driver of the horse and buggy could hear the trolley too. I'm sure he could, it made a lot of noise. One of the interesting things about trolley lines, and I've done a lot of lectures on the trolley lines, uh, is on the right-hand side you see that white patch on the pole. That was the trolley stop. They painted the, the telephone poles where the trolley would stop. But actually they were so desperate for service that they would probably stop anywhere. And then in the local neighborhood, this is a scene of, uh, of this area, taken from in front of um, the, the church across the street. And you can see some of the buildings there. And again, the dirt road and church lane coming down to the, the, the street on the right there. We were very fortunate in our history to have a photographer from Fall River named O.E. Du Bois. And this is one of his cards. He, he had labels on most of them. And I wrote a book on him in, in Oh, 1978, I think it was, somewhere around, 1983, because I had 60 of his postcards of the Sakonet area, and I keep collecting them. I have 660 now. They're really wonderful, real photo postcards like you see here. They're really treasures. Okay, other town events during the time, the Friends Meeting House was being moved, if you can imagine that. It wasn't quite as big as it is now, because obviously additions have been put on, but it was 30 feet it was moved 30 feet back from the highway uh, and was being remodeled, 1890. The, the Friends Meeting House was completed in 1701. And a couple of years ago, there was some thought that it was gonna be for sale. And one guy who came by said, what a great place for a gas station. <laughs> that, that was put off and it's now still under local control. Plans were being made at this time for a new town hall and to move the current town hall, that is the town hall that was there, which had been built in 1881, uh, to the back of the lot behind the town hall. And that happened in April of 1895. And they authorized, the town council authorized construction of the town hall at $5,000. And they did it. <laughs> the trolley line, again, Newport to Fall River, opened on 18 June 1898 along the East Main Road. 
Free delivery of mail began in 1899. So here's a picture of, of St. Paul's Church across the street. One of the things that's interesting about this photograph is you can see in the middle there's a bell tower uh, that obviously is no longer there. But it is important, an important part of the organization of the Portsmouth Town Library. They had an organization called the Thursday Evening Club, and it was mostly made up of parishioners from St. Paul's, and they created, and this is what it said in their instru or organizing instructions, an organization for the purpose of meeting to discuss books, ideas, and provide a cultural self-improvement symposium, whatever that means. Okay. The inspiration of the group was the re pastor of the church, J. Sturgis Pierce, and you see him up here on the chair. This is Sturgis Pierce right here, the minister of St. Paul's. And he was a minister from 1886 to 1911. So they had their programs for this Thursday evening club was a lot of literature and the arts and things like that. It was just kind of a, um, a, a society that gathered together to talk about stuff. Again, and, and keep in mind that the society wasn't very well developed. I mean, again, it was a lot of farming people. So the group met at people's homes sometimes and, and refreshments would be served. And, and eventually it became so popular that the people at whose houses they were having the refreshments got very upset because there was too many people and too much to clean up afterwards. <laughs> so the membership grew and the availability of book discussion, books under discussion uh, became a problem. There weren't any bookstores in Portsmouth. I was thinking about when I wrote that, there aren't any bookstores in Portsmouth now. <laughs> Anyway, the increased number of participants, and obviously if they're gonna talk about the same book, they need a lot of copies of it. That problem is solved today, by the way. Carolyn and everybody take good care of getting extra copies for books because we still do have book clubs here. They met mostly in the fall and the winter because in the spring and summer they were out in the farm. And uh, that's, so that, that's when the society met. Automobiles were just beginning to appear on the streets, but most of the travel was, again, out here in the country, was by horse and buggy. On February 22nd, 1897, Reverend Pierce, at a meeting of the club, stunned the audience. He suggested that we should have a Portsmouth library, public library, financed by the public to provide library services for all in the town. He suggested that the library would be a meeting place for discussion groups like the Thursday Evening Club, and other intellectual pursuits as well, of course, as serving as a lending library. A lot of concern was raised by the populace, though. It was gonna be very expensive and they were really concerned about the cost. But Reverend Pierce, and he was a, a dynamic leader, by the way, he's really an uh, important part of this whole story. He persisted and said that there would be no library then the Thursday evening club could not meet because they were just too popular and there were too many of them. So he convinced enough people at the meeting in, on the 22nd of February, 1897, that he should call a public meeting of the Portsmouth citizens to discuss the prospect of establishing a library in the town. Plans were made to hold a preliminary formation meeting on 13 March, 1897, just about this week, 125 years ago. And the general public was invited, anybody who wanted to come. Over 50 people showed up and there was a lot of interest indicated at that meeting. So they agreed to meet on March 18th, hmm, March 18th, that's today, to establish a Portsmouth Free Public Library Association. And again, they were, you know, there wasn't a whole lot to do in the town at that point, but uh, it was some, some, a cultural thing that people decided, well, maybe we can give this a try. They elected officers, these are the first officers. Reverend Pierce was the first president. Benjamin Tallman was the vice president, William Brayton, the treasurer, and the trustees, John Borden, Benjamin Sherman, and Samuel Sanford. And, and the one that sticks out there in my mind, as you will talk about as I go on, is John L. Borden. He was a very important part of the library, and you'll hear more about him later on. Benjamin Sherman was also a, uh, an important person in the town. He had a house up on top of Turkey Hill, and he had a wife who kept a diary and Abby Sherman kept a diary from 1890, 1896 until 1934. And I got access to those diaries one time and it's well, a treasure trove, I copied most of them. She was also the town gossip because she knew everything was going on. <laughs> anyway, Benjamin was her husband. So these were people who would have a long-term association with the library as it was being organized. They decided there should be dues for the association that they were going to form, and they were set at a dollar. 
per year. And 35 men and women joined the association, and they didn't all pay. <laughs> the next action was to get a charter from the, state, the Secretary of State of Rhode Island. This was granted, stating that the functional library would be for the purposes of free distribution of books and other literary purposes. The charter was dated March 26, 1897, just eight days after the organizational meeting. Now it was on the next problem, where? Where are we going to build this? At first, the town clerk was asked to store books in the town clerk's office, and, and he agreed. And so there was an accumulation of books there, just donations from people. And you can imagine what a, what, what a mess of books that was, uh, all sorts of different, and duplications and, and so on. But the sub library subscriptions were successful, and from dues and donations, by April of 97, library subscriptions totaled $218, and they thought they were sitting fat. Dramatically, however, there came to be a major donor, the aforementioned John L. Borden and his wife, Ruth. They were involved with the organization of the library and served very long with the library as in a role that I will show you in a minute. John Borden was a very wealthy man. He was a farmer, but he was a very wealthy man and had accumulated considerable property uh, in the town. His home was on the, up here on the East Main Road, just a little bit north of here, and here's a picture of it back way back then, sometime, whoop. That's his house, okay? It's been apartments and so on uh, more often. And I don't know, I, I saw a for sale sign out there. I don't know if that was for an apartment or uh, for the whole house, I don't know. Anyway, John Borden was an interesting character. Um, he offered a piece of land that he owned for the building of the library at Cozy Corner. And this is Cozy Corner, if you didn't know that this whole intersection outdoor here. He lived frugally. He and his wife uh, often were seen in the, the basement of their house, sitting there, minding their time late in their life and so on. Uh, and I did some research on him one time because I lived in a house on the uh, old West Main Road that he owned. And so I wanted to find out who he was. And I, so I looked up his will in the town hall and his will was 55 pages long. He accumulated a lot of property and a lot of wealth, although he lived very frugally. So this is a lot that he donated to the library, which is obviously, for our purposes even today, a really important central location for something like a library. His wife died fairly early on in the 20th century, but he, can, he remained very much committed to the library uh, for almost 40 years, and he was a great benefactor of the library. This is John and his wife, Ruth. The beneficence of the Bordens encouraged other people to make donations as well, and the library was on its way. Again, he was the big inspiration, and as we'll see, he was the, the president for about 30-some years. So plans were drawn. The original cost estimate for the original building here was $2,000. Think about that. And they had 1,700 in hand. So construction was completed in December of 1898, and the final cost was $2,363. Amazing. To compare numbers, it's just impossible. So one of the major donors, though, to the library was a man by the name of Cornelius Vanderbilt. Not the original Commodore, but Cornelius Vanderbilt, I think he's the second, actually, although he wasn't the son of the Commodore. He's the grandson of the Commodore. He had a farm at, uh, at Oakland Farm, and he donated $500. And he, as, I, as it says here, he was at that time, 1898, he was the wealthiest man in the United States. Okay. And he died in 1899. That left his, his wealth to his two children, two male children, Reginald Vanderbilt, who had Sandy Point Farm, and Alfred Gwynne Vanderbilt, who, had Oak, who inherited Oakland. So now the library needed books once it was done. There were a lot of nondescript don donations that came, and it was a big project to select what would be useful. As far as I could determine, they didn't buy any books. They just took donations at that point. And so we have, at that time, again, another picture that you've seen already, but this is a postcard of the Portsmouth Library. Okay. The space on the right is for writing a message. In the early days of postcards, and postcards began around here in uh, early 18. 90s. 
And the only thing you could put on the back of a postcard, they were called private mailing cards, was the address. So they had to make room on the front for people to write a message. That's why this is, it's an actual postcard size, but you write the message over here. Okay. This is a newspaper article from that time. All right. Oh, whoops, too far. All right. Back one. Where'd I go here? Wait a minute, I jumped. Help. I leaned on the button here. An article in the Daily News of the founding and establishment of the library. You can't read it very well, but I do have a copy of that up here that you want to look at afterwards. And so this is April of 1898. Now, push the right button. Abby Sherman, who I mentioned before, the husband of, uh, the wife of uh, Benjamin, who was on the board, commented in her diary that day, in, in addition to her attending the organizational meetings of the library earlier, the men of her family went to, the, to grade the library lot in September of 1898. And later, on the 29th of December, she records that she went to the library dedication that day. So, by 1899, there was a lot of pride in the Portsmouth Library. Again, there wasn't much else cultural in the town, and so it was really important. And in addition, they built tennis courts out here on this side of the lot, <laughs> on the southern part of the library lawn. They had tennis courts, and they got in trouble because the Buildings and Grounds Committee didn't maintain them very well. Anyway, that was part of the early minutes. So one of the problems, be, in spite of its, its location, was access. How do we get there? Again, unless you're riding a horse or a horse and buggy. The library was open six hours a week, which was, I think, I think it was Thursday evening and Saturday afternoon and Saturday evening. Okay. Eventually, though, the Newport and Providence Street Railway Company was built out the West Main Road, and it came inland to Freeborn Street and came, turned there to go on to Bristol Ferry Road, and uh, so there was a, a station for the, the trolley line just down beyond where the bank is here. And so the trolleys did provide access. You never could rely on the trolleys. The trolleys were limited to 10 miles an hour. I think they exceeded it sometimes. But the service was, was not great in terms of trying to get to the library Thursday evening at 6 o'clock to find out, you know, to be able to get there on time. Eventually, in 1925, the, both the trolley lines went out of business and were replaced by um, by buses. And the person who was responsible for that mainly was a member of the Newport and Providence Street Railway Company who developed the uh, Bonanza Bus Company, and that was Alfred, Alfred Gwynne Vanderbilt's son, William Vanderbilt, who also lived at Oakland Farm. So they got, did get transportation eventually, as long as you lived on the East or West Main Road. So the library facilities became very popular later on, and especially in the 1920s, as we started getting into the situation that led to the Depression, and people didn't have much money to spend, and they would be very much involved in something like the library. And at that time, increasingly, and, and you see this chart up here, I think it's really instructive. The original library is the orange. And you can see over years, and there are a whole bunch of them there, uh, additions that were put onto the library. That's a great chart. That really shows how, how it expanded. And it's pretty much expanded to the max right now, by the way. That's, although we really want them to make it bigger, get bring more things in here. Anyway, the Alice Sherman, who was a librarian, and her predecessor, Hattie Anthony, who was a, a librarian for a long time, in 1931 urged the board to put an addition onto the building. And John Borden, who was president 1908 to 1933, gave $5,000 for the addition. So an L was added to the northwest corner, that way, okay, uh, for book storage. In addition, the furnace was replaced, and they built a bathroom in the building, which there hadn't been before. Uh, anyway, the cost of the whole upgrading was $4,227, and John Borden said, keep the change. Okay. So that's the kind of guy he was. So then in, in the 1930s, FDR was elected in 1932, took office in 1933, uh, and ushered in the New Deal. The New Deal was a, an assistance program 
from the government to really allow different organizations such as libraries through the state to get grants and that was really important. I, I, I'm sure Carolyn and Mike could tell you how important grants are to the library even today. They really are. So the state government and the town made grants available and restored a, a grant that the town had been giving for, of $300. The first grant was $100. Uh, it's a little bit more now. Um, but they uh, gave the grants and it was still hard times for the library. And, and the librarian really had to work hard to get her $40 a week. As a respite for people in hard times, obviously, libraries were very important in the 19, late 20s and into the 30s. Circulation grew substantially through the 30s and in, in World, War, World War II times. The library was expanded in 1935, and it looked like that. Now, during the war, we had a war bond rally. It, it came out of Newport. There was one in Newport, and then they decided to have one out here as well. And they brought a, a group of really important people, some in the literary world, world some in the political world, uh, to Portsmouth. And they made a plea for, um, for war bonds at that time. And here's the group that came. You can read the names underneath. I'll, I'll read them anyway if you can't see that far. Carl Van Doren, who was a major publisher. Lillian Hellman. Lillian Hellman had her loyalty to the United States challenged in the McCarthy era, and, and she lost, by the way. Um, and, and I don't know who Colonel Enriquez is or Angela Gunn, who are the next ones. The next one with the beautiful hat was Carlotta, Carlotta Cogshill, and she devoted a lot of time and a lot of service to the library. She was the president for a while. Next comes Bennett Cerf, who some of you who are as old as I am remember from What's My Line on TV. Um, he was a publish, book publisher as well. And the next in the background is Dr. Storrs. Dr. Storrs, Burton Storrs lived across the street in one of those little houses across the street there. <clears throat> and he was a great patron and, and friend of the library as well. Then you have Judge Sullivan, who was from Newport. He came with a group from Newport out here. And the last one is very, very important. His name is Ernest Denemy. And Ernest Denemy was a very special person to the library. One of the things, and I'm very grateful to him, is the fact that he wrote a 46-page history of the library in the early 1970s. So that enabled me to get a lot of this information, which was great. But I knew him. I knew him well, and, and I'll talk more about him. He was the president of the library for a long time, too. And here's another picture from that day when they were um, oh. Hold on. There we go. Here we have. Francis Fennell, I'm not sure who he was. And you have Lillian Hellman in the middle and Carlotta Cogshaw on the right. Doing something with the flag, I'm not sure what. This was 1945, by the way, early in 45 before the war ended, but not long before the war ended. <laughs> okay, so into the 60s, the library continued to be an important part of the town and relied significantly, as it does today, on town funding in addition to what the library can raise. The library asked the town meeting in 1963 for $1,800. We had town meetings in those days. Some of you remember them, uh, an annual financial town meeting. They lasted until, I think it was 1988, and they were quite a show. <laughs> where everybody went and everybody wanted money, and once the school School's budget was settled, everybody went home. Anyway, um, that was always the issue because the town meeting set the tax rate. They, they set the budget, which set the tax rate. So they still had, the, t the library still had to dip into some of its endowment. John Borden had left the library a trust fund of $50,000, which is pretty amazing. He died in 1933. But he left a, a, a larger donation to the Newport Hospital. $500,000. And you know, at the Newport Hospital, there's the Borden Wing. It's Borden Carey now. But, but that was his donation uh, to the library. 500 grand. His will was just amazing, all the different things in it. In 1966, a woman by the name of Rosemary Finneran was hired as the librarian. 
and she would eventually serve the library for 41 years, retiring in 2007. Okay. So the library emerged <clears throat> as the cultural center of the town, which in, in some ways it still is, in many ways it still is, with lectures, book clubs, wine and cheese fundraisers, book sales, and all kinds of activities for, for residents of all ages. Here's a list of the founding members. And if, if there's, there are two lists. There's another, next slide is a list, too. This is the history of Portsmouth. I mean, all the famous names of Portsmouth. There's a lot of you know, Tallmans and Braytons and Cogshills and names like that on there, the charter members. And then these, they had early elected members, which are on the next slide. They, whoop, don't go, don't go. OK. The char rest of the charter members on the left. And if you look at those last names, uh, there's a lot of them still around. There's probably a lot of them sitting in this room right now. Anyway, and then the elected members who were added, again, a, a lot of very uh, well-known names. So the library continued to grow and serve the people of Portsmouth, and there continued to be a need for more space, as you can see on that chart over there on the, uh, up against there. I mean, it's just amazing how, how it grew and, and grew and grew. It's almost out of land now, though. That's the problem. Anyway, by 1985, there were 600 members of the Library Association, and dues were up to $5 a year. In December of 1986, Rosemary Finneran was honored for 20 years service with the library. And there were all celebrations for that at that time. The board continued to improve the activities of the library under the leadership of Ernest Denemy. Carl Courier, Richard Kessler, and Ovation, Charlie Pierce, and Ed Kader. I was a member of the board from 1980, 1975 to 1981, and uh, after serving as vice president for most of that time, I decided that I wanted to do a couple other things, like get into the photography business, um, and I was teaching at the same time. So I was replaced as vice president by Michael Mello. He only served as vice president for one year. Then he became president, and he still is. Okay. <laughs> right. It's amazing. As it says, such persistence and love for the organization. We really are truly blessed by, by Mike's long-term commitment to this library. <clears throat> so in, in 1989, it was decided that the library should be enlarged. And the plan that came out enlarged it to twice the size that it had been before. And the plan for a budget was $850,000. 1989 dollars. We can sort of deal with that a little bit better. But ultimately, the cost of the library expansion was 1.4 million. Big, big bucks, big job. And while that was underway, the library was closed for a while, and 5,000 books were moved to the high school library, <coughs> where Shirley Cherry, who was the, li the, uh, li the librarian for the high school, was very helpful in keeping the library functioning. And the new library was opened on June 3rd, 1991. Again, twice the original size. A few other highlights. In March of 1992, the library joined the statewide Cooperating Libraries Automatic, Automated Network, CLAN, which brought in a, a great expansion of the availability of books and so on, and, and awareness of other libraries cooperating and, and working together, which was great. Continuing on, and we give them great credit for their enthusiasm, book sales, concerts, raffles, other kind of fundraisers, fundraisers uh, as a way to support the town grants for the operation of the library. And in the summer of 1999, a new event was planned called the Taste of Portsmouth. And the Taste of Portsmouth continues to be a very popular fundraiser. We've been a little bit shot down on, with the virus over the last couple of years, but it's really a great commitment to bring the people of the town together to see what's in the library and associate with one another. It's really a great, great opportunity. In the spring of 1999, two new staff members were, were hired, Margaret Chatfield and Carolyn Magnus, who's obviously still here, sitting in the back of the room. The library expanded its servers by buying online computer access. Just think, a library is going to have computers. Wow. I mean, that was really something unique in 19, when was it, about 1999, somewhere around there. Anyway, seven new personal computers, uh, computers and that's always obviously been expanded uh, since that time. 
1996, again, plans were being made to celebrate 100 years of the library. And on January 15, 1997, a lecture was given on the history of the library by me. <laughs> Meanwhile, a new fundraiser was created in cooperation with Clements Market. Over the years, a considerable amount of money of donations to the library have been received by this fund where you turn in your, your receipts from Clements and they help. And what's the percentage? 1% 1 of those receipts. Clements makes donations to the library, and that's, that's a substantial amount of money over the years. There was a summer reading program for children in 1999 where 366 children participated. Again, that's, that's it's really part of the widespread nature of the, um, of the library's work. In 2000, the library opened on Sunday afternoons, spare the thought. You know, Sunday afternoon for a, about four or five hours. The library also received a great donation from the state of, uh, from John Pierce, this was before he passed away, uh, and a lot of Portsmouth related historical artic articles and archives, including a collection of glass plate negatives that some people in the library authority said, I don't know what these glass things are. Well, at that time, I was a professional photographer with a dark room, so we decided I would, I would print them. And Mike asked me, you know, what's it going to cost us? And I said, one for you and one for me. And so <laughs> that Pierce collection is here in the library, and it's a wonderful collection of photographs, a lot of them from the, oh, 1900 to 1920 period. And if you ever get a chance, I think we, we have all that on our computer, you can, you can look through that. It's, it's a great collection of stuff. Anyway, that's glass plates were, were unbelievably sharp, and they're great photographs. That's part of my 4,000 collection of postcards and pictures from around here. Anyway, then we got artifacts from the Brown University-led archaeological dig in Island Park. And this archaeological dig was done before they decided to reconstruct the, um, the ponds out in Island Park. And part of it was due to that gravel plant that they built down there. Uh, but what happened was they flooded much of the original settlement area, including Ann Hutchinson's house, Will Hutchinson's house. Um, and so the archaeological dig was done before that happened. So that's another treasure trove of, of stuff. Some of it's in Brown and some of it's here. In 2001, Robert, Rosemary Finneran and Yolanda Eichhardt were honored for 35 years of service to the library. This keeps going on. OK. More fundraising was taken and a lot of renovations were done in the spring, winter and spring of, of 2002. The children's library was set up in the basement with 19,000 volumes. The library was carpeted throughout and a new circulation desk was installed. A lot of support over time has come from several foundations, especially the Champlin Foundation, which has been very good to the library. The library circulation in 2001 was 124,000 volumes. Pretty impressive. In uh, 2005, the town purchased the Teachman property, which is the property over that direction to the south of here. South? East? <laughs> West! <laughs> okay. Uh, anyway, and that property was purchased by the town with the library fundraising that was carried on at the time. The whole parking area was, was created. Think about that. Until that time, you know, for about 105 years, the only parking we had was out front here. Finally, on July 1, 2007, Rosemary Finneran retired as the library director after a long tenure of 41 years of service to the library. And she had begun back in 1966. Carolyn Magnus replaced her as library director, and of course she still fulfills that job today. A grant in 2007, a grant of $10,000 was received for from the Bank of Newport, and more of the Pierce collection was added to the library's collection. A new entrance ramp was installed in 2008, and in 2013, Portsmouth celebrated its 375th anniversary, as many of you remember. And we, we had a lot of fun with that. I was, I was the historian on the committee, and I gave, I think it was 10 lectures over the course of that year, and we had so many activities in this town. There was so much pride generated by the fact that Portsmouth had been around for 375 years and wanted to celebrate it. It was just a great year of activity, and much of the activity was held here.
in the library. The summer of 2014 saw the creation of the Book Nook, which is around the corner here. And if you haven't been to the Book Nook, you should. If you're a reader, there really are some great bargains there, some books that you can spend a whole dollar for. And, uh, it just, and some of them are, are really fairly new stuff, and a great variety of everything. I mean, everything from history to cookbooks to everything. Anyway, the Book Nook, which has provided a real great opportunity for people to deposit and purchase books of all kinds. It's a great resource for people who share books that they no longer need or want, and we all do that. I have a couple of thousand myself. Anyway, it's, it's a really good resource. I still buy them from the Book Nook, by the way. So in the fall of, of 2014, the library cel celebrated its 15th anniversary of the Taste of Portsmouth, and it's, again, it's just a great opportunity. It's, it's a highlight of, of town life, really, and hopefully, as the virus fades, we hope, uh, we'll be able to do that all the time. In 19, 2018, Ann Wagner started a tradition of reading the Declaration of Independence here at the library every, every 4th of July. And again, that's an important reminder of our historical tradition as well. The difficulties associated with COVID affected a lot of things that were going, have gone on at the library, especially in 2021, 2020 and 2021. But a lot of activity was carried out online. Book circulation continued to be very strong. Um, but the virus has hit all of us, as I don't think I have to tell anyone. Some of the operation hours were cut back, some of the, but the circulation remained strong. Here's some comparative numbers that, that Carolyn put through it. Kind of interesting. I'll just read them real quick. The circulation in, uh, this is then and now. Circulation in 1899 was 233 books for the whole year. In February, the month of February this year, 5,737, just one month, okay? Board members, there were seven back then, there are 16, 16 now. The Library Association members in that first year or two was 85, it's now 1,004. The hours of operation were six back in that day, they are now 55 hours a week. The collection, as it was getting going, was 2,000. It's now 60,393 books, DVDs, music CDs, C music CDs, audio books, I'm having trouble reading small, uh, and uh, Kindles and, and so on. The building was wired for electricity in 1913. They had gas lamps before that. And the, it was wired for the internet in 1990 and developed our own website in 1998. The library budget in 1905 was, was $150 a year. In 2022, it's 708,000. The library staff was one person, and if she got sick, the library didn't get open back in 1897. There are 19 full-time and part-time employees now, and we need them probably need more. The bathrooms, there weren't any at the beginning. There are three now, that's quite progress. And the um, cost comparison, when the library was built, it was uh, $2,363. And in February of 2022, the electric bill was $2,097. <laughs> Interesting. Um, so the, the Cost to build the library, as I said before, was, was 2,363, and the, um, I'm sorry, I, I'm repeating myself. Anyway, Carolyn put this letter, list together, and it's really an interesting comparison over time. A few important people that were associated with the library's history, and there's many more. I just picked out some of the highlights. Much of this is from Ernest Enemy's um, history. John Borden, I mentioned a couple of times before. President from 1908 to 1933, and a major donor, benefactor to the library. George R. Hicks was a town clerk. He also was a big supporter of the library. He was president for four years in the 30s and treasurer for 29 years. Boy, people got those jobs, they kept them, huh? <laughs> Reverend J. Sturgis Pierce, the founder and president, and president from 1897 to 1901. J. Fred Sherman was a state senator 
in the, the uh, 40s and into the early 50s. He was the president here from 49 to 55. At the same time, he was president of the Portsmouth Historical Society and one of its founders. It was founded in, in 1938. Carlotta Cogshaw, I mentioned, a devoted president for nine years through the war. Ernest Denemy, I mentioned him before, uh, a special, really special person to the library. He wrote a 46-page history of the library. We need somebody to update it, though, from 1975, I think it was. Sarah Eddy, you may have heard of. She was the head of an artist colony in, at, um, at, down in, uh, in Portsmouth. A donor of the art room, she was an artist, a sculptor, a writer, and a strong supporter of the library. She was really at Bristol Ferry. That was, she was the, the heart of the artist colony at uh, Bristol Ferry. Edith Taylor Nicholson, she was the woman who built, her husband built the Glen Manor House in 19, well, it was complete in 1924. And it's, by the way, it's coming up for its 100th anniversary too, which is an important thing. And I was involved with that for about 25 years, too, when, when we first tried to make it into a wedding palace. Hmm. I guess we succeeded with that. The, but she left a number, the children's room in the library and over $30,000 for a number of projects. She died in, uh, I should know this, she died about 1954. Dr. Storrs, I mentioned, he was the treasurer for 16 years, and his wife also was very much involved on the library board. It was very difficult to try to get a list of all the librarians because there were a lot. I, I listed some of them. And I'll let you, you can read the list. I'll give you a minute or two to, to read it. But again, there's a great variety and many of them were, were five or 10 years. A couple of them were 30 and 35 years. Bobby Stevens, who is here tonight, was the associate director for 20 some years. Rosemary Finneran and Carol Magnus, who's been here since 07. And again, that's, that's just the leaders of the library. There were a lot of other people who have served as, as, on the uh, leadership of the library over time and still do. The <coughs> library, in conclusion, was founded in 1897, 125 years ago this week. It has a great history, and there's a lot more to it that I, I figured 50 slides was probably enough. Uh, anyway, it's much more than a lending library in our town, and it still is that. It's, it's much more than that. It's played a big role in a lot of aspects of the town. I can remember my kids were involved in a, a drama program in the summer when they were in probably sixth and seventh grade, which was a really fun thing. They put on a play. Uh, but the future is bright for the library, and again, we are fortunate to have it as a cultural center in our town. It's come a long way from the Thursday Evening Club back in, in 1897. And so here's to 125 more years. I have one final statement. Before I make this statement, I want to say there are some library archives up here that I've collected over the years, uh, and some of which I've written. But uh, if you want to look at that after we're done. I have a dedication for this lecture if I can get through it. <laughs> it's dedicated to two very important people in my life. The first is Ernest Denemy, who, again, told me back in 1975, when we were up at Fort Butts one time, he said, you have to get busy writing Portsmouth's history, wonderful history, young man, because if you don't do it, who's going to? Well, here we are about 40 years later, <laughs> and I'm still doing it. <laughs> and also my late, late wife, Dottie, who passed away last fall, was a longtime member of the board of this library, and without whose encouragement, I could never have accomplished all that I've done in my very passionate hobby that I still continue every day today. So my everlasting gratitude and affection to you both, and here's a picture of the two of them. That was taken about 1975 or so. So with that, I'll stop talking. I have to stop talking. I can't talk. I got some more water. Um, but I'll be happy to try to answer any questions. Or are there other people like Mike and Carolyn here who could answer questions as well? But uh, we are so fortunate in this town to have so much history going back to 1638. Join in. I'm not going to last forever doing these lectures. So you better find somebody. 
anyway, thank you all very much for coming. I really appreciate it. Yes, uh, John, going back 60 years or so to high school history, I remember that one of the, uh, one of the tycoons, might have been Mellon, donated, if a town wanted a library, he donated money. Do I have that right? This Carnegie. library? Carnegie. 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 Oh, that was Carnegie. 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 Okay. Did, did we tap into any of that money? I'm sorry, which library? Carnegie. 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 Yeah. Oh, donated any money to this library. I do not know. I don't, know I don't think so. I don't think so. Maybe, maybe this library was up and running, so if the town didn't have a library, that's where his money went. Yeah, yeah it's this, this, imagine what this town was like in 1897. Yeah. Really rural. <laughs> I mean, when you went down off of East Main Road to, to get to the, the Sakana River, you're going through grass this high. And, and I, this Daily News article that I found has pictures of that. It said, you know, Portsmouth is just gone. It's, all, it's just a wasteland. I'm so glad. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? Are we going to have another taste of Portsmouth? I know for a couple of years they haven't. We hope to. Once all this COVID dies down, we'd like to do a repeat. They were fun. Is it they were a blast. We so what, much fun what time of year? Yeah. October. It was so the third <laughs> Friday. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really great for to honor the, the merchants of the town and show their wares and everything. It's really a great thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are the Shermans that you mentioned the same Shermans that are affiliated with the Newport Village? Distantly, not directly. The Shermans that came here, there were Shermans that came here in, well, in, in 1638. And the main area that the Shermans controlled was at the top of uh, Quaker Hill. They had a, a house there. I can remember seeing the house. And they had a barn across the street where that sandwich shop is. But they owned everything from there down to the water. That was their farm. And Abby Sherman just tells, I, I should do a lecture on her sometime. Because she knew everything that was going on in this town. And, and who was who. They were building a trolley line past the house today and things like that. I mean, it's just really interesting stuff. And, and some of their de descendants loaned me the diaries. 25 years ago, probably. And um, I went back about five years ago to try to get them back for a while. I was going to copy the whole thing. I have a whole notebook full of stuff, but I copied part of it. But I wanted to get the diaries back, and I was told that the diaries had been disseminated among the family. Oh. And it just could not be retrieved. And, and again, 1890 something to 1933, everything was going on in the town. Oh. Um, but I have a good digest of it anyway. Other questions? Was Arthur Sherman a relative of those? Yes, descendants? Arthur Sherman was Abby and Benjamin's son. And Arthur, some of you might, most of you probably know, he was a state representative, a state senator. He was the head of the state senate in the 1920s. Uh, and uh, then he, after that, he became town clerk. And he was town clerk for about 35 years. I knew him, I met him. He probably died in the early 70s, I think. Anyway, so, yes? Is that diagram available on our website? No, not no. yet, but I hope it will be. Yeah, Me too. I well, asked friends that grow up here moved away. Yeah, Carolyn sent it to me, and, and somehow I lost it in tripping, copying it. Everything. I want to copy that, too. It really is amazing to see the growth. And, and the way that's laid out particularly, because the orange is the original library. Yeah. <laughs> so it just kept expanding, beige, whatever. Anyway, yeah, any other questions? Well, again, thank you all for coming. Come up and look at some of these archives here. Just take a look and see uh, what's here. I really appreciate it. Thank you.